Welcome back to another episode of Lost in the Farmer's Market Garden Shorts. Today, in between the rainstorms, we're talking about our subject of discussion. Solanum lycopersicum, also known as tomato. Now, we know that it's in the Solanaceae family, which means the nightshade. However, I should point out that it is native to South and Central America, which means it's a native species, because surely its distribution was further than that in the Americas. It's, according to the USDA, it is considered an annual in all of the United States, but I imagine in certain parts of South America where there isn't really a winter in our conventional sense, it might be a short-lived perennial much like peppers. Its preferred soil pH is 5.5 to 7.5. Its exposure is partial to full sun. Now there's proviso to that. In the southeast, like North Carolina, that's partial, meaning morning sun, afternoon shade for optimal performance, unless you have a high water table to counteract wilting and stress. In the north, it can be full sun all day because the sun isn't quite as intense. Um, it's just the nature of the climate there. Now, what's interesting is when you talk about maximum height and width, there are two sets of numbers you need to pay attention to. In the case of indeterminate vines, which continue growing until at such time as they're mowed down by frost, or you take them down yourself because it's seasonal change, they can get six to eight feet tall, with staking, of course, not on their own. Or they can get a width of two to three feet. When you're talking about determinate tomatoes, which are ones that basically stop growing at a certain point, the height varies, but they can be up to five feet tall, though three to four feet is average. That means a two to three foot average span width. Now, getting into names, because this is where it gets interesting. Solanum lycopersicon is a relatively new scientific name for these plants. Up until about maybe 10 years ago, they were known as lycopersicon esculentum. Now, esculentum basically means edible, but lycopersicon, which is still in the new name, means wolf peach. Lycos, wolf, persicon, peach, or peach colored, which tells you what the original tomatoes that Euro Europeans encountered were. They weren't red, they were peach or yellowy colored, which is very fascinating, because that means the low acid types probably were the first types, but it gets better. You see, tomatoes have other names. In Spanish, it's tomate. In the Aztec language, the original language in which the plant was cultivated, and original people, it's tomato. Now I'm probably mangling that, but let's go into the language there. Toma means to loosen or unwrap, and tomato was used at one point to mean without defect. Jitomate, and I'm mangling that, means red tomato, and is probably the proper verbiage for use with respect to the people who originally cultivated this lovely plant. Now, what's fascinating is that tomatoes originally probably ha all had husks, like uh, tomatillos and ground cherries. And we bred that out, and what's left is that big calyx, or calyx, depending on how you want to pronounce that, that's on top, that star-shaped thing that looks like a little hat, and the stem coming out of the top. We bred them past that. We bred to get bigger fruits, which goes back to the original Aztec word, tomato, meaning swelling fruit. Of course, they called anything nightshady tomato. So, cherry tomatoes, ground cherries, husk tomatoes or tomatillos, they were all called that. And then the, there were adjectives attached to it, meaning different varieties and shapes and colors and all that, which is really cool. But what's interesting, now I'm going to settle an argument that we've had a long time when it comes to tomatoes. No, not tomato versus tomato. Nobody cares how you pronounce that. It's irrelevant. No. Tomatoes are botanically a berry due to the way the fruit is structured. They're a berry, which means technically they're fruit. However, and that's a scientific perspective, they are in fact a fruit, a berry fruit. But... We eat them as though they are a vegetable. We prepare them, in America at least, as though they are a vegetable. So which is it? Well, scientifically it is in fact a fruit. No big deal. That we use it as a vegetable is 
a cultural thing. So, realistically, it's safer to say that it's both. I know some of y'all are not satisfied with that answer, but too bad. We ain't going to perpetuate your problems. Now, what's interesting is that tomatoes, in a culinary sense, are the most readily available source of the flavoring umami. I know that sounds like a yo mama joke waiting to happen, but it's not. Umami is this Japanese word that describes a flavor that, and I say this with utmost disdain, foodies and other people like hipsters and people who want to sound fancy have picked up. What it means is savory. That's all it is. It's just savory. It's a fancy word for savory. It's not a new flavor. It's exactly savory. You know, sort of like how people say mouthfeel. It's texture, you adult. Anyway, anything to feel fancy and cutting edge or whatever. For no game whatsoever. Now, we're going to go into the nutritional part. Because, quite frankly, you can hear my disdain at certain things. Nutritionally speaking, for one tomato that is roughly medium-sized, or about 123 grams, it will have 22 calories, 6 milligrams of sodium, 292 milligrams of potassium. I mean, who the hell needs bananas when you got tomatoes, baby? Mmm, pour the ketchup in my face. Yeah, it has 1.1 gram of uh, protein. It has 28% of your daily requirement of vitamin C, 5% of B6, 3% of magnesium, 1% of calcium, and in there somewhere is some vitamin K. I don't have a number for that. I looked it up and nobody could give me a straight number, so I just listed it, because it is important. Now, tomatoes are a major dietary source of lycopene, which, if you don't know what lycopene is, it's actually an element that is found in guys. Hey, guys out there is found to reduce the risk of prostate cancer. Yeah, boys, protect your boys. That's all I gotta say about that. Protect the boys. Also, I mean, it also helps in a bunch of other ways, but that's the real one for guys out there. So, um, eat your pasta sauce, kids. Trust me. That's why that. Now, beta-carotene is also in there, which is typically the thing that gives it the color. It's converted to vitamin A in your body. I don't know what the uh, conversion amount is, but it's enough to be worth mentioning. There is also something called narginogen. Nargenin? Nargenin, yeah. My handwriting failed there on the notes. It's in the tomato skin, and it's an anti-inflammatory. So folks, peeled tomatoes are a waste of time. Get the skins. You pay, you're going to pay any full price for the tomatoes anyway. Get the skins. They're not so bad. I mean, pause, you know, when you buy canned tomatoes and they're peeled, you're basically throwing nutrition away. Anyway, and also chlorogenic acid, which is an antioxidant that may lower blood pressure. Yeah, so that summarizes the nutrition section of tomatoes. Now I'm going to talk about care and culture of tomatoes. As you can see, I have a lovely specimen in front of you. This is a Cherokee purple. In the southeast... Beef steak or slicer tomatoes come in basically two categories. Now, you have the heirloom and you have the conventional. You know, Bush Goliath, Big Boy, all that. Uh, personally, I hate those. Um, mostly because they're determinate, they're not very adaptable, and they all get about the same range of diseases. They say they're resistant, but they're not. Um, growing tomatoes is fairly easy, actually. Now, oh, by the way, for the heirlooms, the varieties that seem to do the best, just from field to 10 years of field trials. Cherokee Purple and Black Cream are the two best big slicers. They produce really well. Paul Robeson, Aunt Lou's Underground Railroad, those are two others. You have to get the seed through a uh, Southern Exposure seed. Um, Black Cream you can get anywhere. Cherokee Purple you can get anywhere. Those are the easy parts. Now, as you can see, I have this in a 10-gallon pot. Um, and in case you're wondering what the heck is going on now, let's zoom in for a second. That is shredded peat pots from plants that have failed or were turned into compost or the soil was recycled. I put it down there as a sort of ad hoc version of uh, mulch. And it allows me to use the sprayer nozzle at full force on the soil without eroding the soil or damaging roots. 
It also keeps weeds down and keeps the moisture in. And after a few waterings, it deforms enough that it will not wash away, which is really great. It's also decaying organic matter, which is always a good thing. Well, anyway, let me zoom back out for a second. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at that too. Mm. Anyway, so growing tomatoes. Basically, you need a standardized potting soil. Pretty good on the organic mix. I always recommend adding a composted manure product or compost if you have it. If you have compost, mix it in with the soil or layer it. You know, two inches of normal of potting soil, inch of compost, two inches of potting soil, something like that. Or just straight blend it. But you gotta have it in there so the roots can find it and then find another batch and you get these intermittent growth phases and fruiting phases that allows the plant to survive stress because, you know, compost will inevitably hold more moisture than normal soil will. Next, Epsom salts, folks. Plain old Epsom salts. That's magnesium sulfate, I think. Uh, it's got magnesium. Well, anyway, it's apparently nightshade performance enhancing drugs. It's a teaspoon or a tablespoon per foot of plant height, and you can round that out, or I believe it's a tablespoon per gallon of water for anything else. It's cheap, it's effective, it's a naturally occurring material, so it's actually not something that was made in a lab. It's cheap. It's super cheap. And then as a last thought, cages, steaks, whatever you need to keep them grown straight. Um, eventually they will outgrow your cages no matter what you do. That's just the part of life. That means you get it right. Now, there are two diseases that, uh, two problems that tomatoes never really get. Tomato hornworms, which you can't help because they're laid by a moth which is attracted to your garden by the scents of the tomatoes and other nightshades. You can trap crop them by growing flowering tobacco. Or other nightshades that would be interested in. They seem not to ever be interested in peppers, which is like, woo! Yeah, I know, I don't understand why they only go after tomatoes, but they'll go after um, Datura, Angel, Devil's Trumpet, and they'll go after flowering tobacco as well. And flowering tobacco is its own benefit. If they're chewing on that, who cares? The chewing on your tomatoes, you care, and we've had some damage here in the gardens this year. Now, as a last thought, tomatoes, like I said, if you have a good, enriched, organic, heavy soil, you really won't need to use any other fertilizers, though I do like to use the, uh, I occasionally like to use Alaska fish fertilizer, just give them a shot of organic nitrogen. I just did, there was a video I just did on thunderstorms and nitrogen, and sometimes you cannot count on Mother Nature to drop the goods. So you have to do the do yourself. And that's where Alaska fish fertilizer comes in, that's where, that's where having good soil comes in, and that's where the, the afternoon shade comes in, because then the plants stress less. Our afternoon sun in the south is like a laser, and it can cause all kinds of damage and stress. And stress can cause a plant to drop fruit or not produce it at all. It can also cause a plant to utilize, use up a certain key soil nutrient, calcium. Now, when the bottoms of your tomatoes go soggy and turn black and look like they're molding off, that's blossom end rot. Blossom end rot can be remedied by one simple method. Yes, you could put down limestone, but depending on the three types of limestone available, that is not an immediate solution. It's a long-term solution. Hydrated lime goes into effect within 30 days but can scorch plants because it's very strong. Bone meal technically is a, lime, a, a calcium product but it takes up to 60 days to kick in. Um, dolomitic lime also takes about 60 days to kick in, that's the pelletized type. Um, it's good but it's not fast enough. Blossom end rot can destroy a well-sized beefsteak style tomato or Cherokee purple in the case of what you're looking at. It can destroy that within two to three weeks. Not enough time. And the last thing, agricultural lime, which is basically finely crushed rock, and you can see little chunks in it, takes 90 days to go into effect. So again, these are all long-term solutions. The short-term solution is to go to the store and buy a no-frill store brand antacid tech packet. You know, the cheapest one you can find. Um, preferably without a fancy flavor. And crush that up, regular strength, crush that up in a cup of warm water. Crush it up and put it in a cup of warm water, let it dissolve, stir it until it does, and apply that to each plant. Depending on severity, you can multiply this dose up to a gallon and crush up a bunch of tablets and have like your crazy lime water. Hey, it's alkali water for plants. 
Well, anyway, you can do that, and what it will do is it will supplement the calcium while any other solution you have in play goes into play. You know, like if you put down lime, it'll do the do in the short term, stop it, and then the lime will stop it long term. And that's how you stop blossom and rot. This works on any member of the nightshade family, and all nightshades benefit from a little calcium to help them grow. So, that's the world of tomatoes in a nutshell. Now, oh, I was going to say, on the hornworms, one last thing. You're going to have to hand pick them, or you can wait for wasps to get at them, because they are like, they're like candy for wasps, which is why I always say, don't kill a wasp nest unless it's in imminent danger, like the nest is in a bad location. Otherwise, they'll do you a favor by picking these little buggers off. That said, that is the world of tomatoes, that's where they came from, that's the nutrition, that's everything you ever need to know. If you have any questions, please put them down in the uh, comments section. If you like this episode, hit like and, and please subscribe. Um, don't forget to hit up the blog. We're going to have a new episode up very shortly. I'm working on that as I'm working on this. And as always, folks, keep them growing. Thank you for watching. <laughs>